Well, welcome to CSIS. I'm Meredith Broadbent, the William M. Schultz Chair in International Business. And our conversation today is about the U.S. Trade and Investment Partnership <coughs> Initiative in the Middle East and also the European neighborhood policy with the region. Uh, where Egypt and Tunisia and the other countries in the Middle East head following the Arab Spring will have enormous impact on U.S. and European strategic and geopolitical interests. It is important that the United States and Europe have, an, have effective tools to offer support and promote communication and cooperation and help in the development of well-functioning governments in the region. In the United States, it is expected that there'll be less funding available for foreign assistance programs, so expanding trade and investment is even more of a priority. The U.S. Trade and Investment Partnership Initiative in the Middle East and North Africa, which the President called for in a speech on May 19th, is aimed at facilitating more trade with the region, building on existing agreements to promote integration with U.S. and European markets, and opening the door for those countries that adopt high standards of reform and trade liberalization to construct a regional trade arrangement. The European neighborhood policy, and that's neighborhood with a B-O-U-R instead of a B-O-R policy, as I understand it, is aimed at achieving political reform and good governance, governance competitiveness, and productivity of economies <coughs> and socioeconomic sustainability of the development process in the Middle East. In North Africa. To help us better appreciate these important programs, we're lucky to have with us today, to my left, Dan Mullaney. He's Assistant USTR for Europe and the Middle East. As Assistant USTR for Europe and the Middle East, he oversees U.S. trade policy towards these countries and other European trading partners in Eurasia and also countries in Northern Africa. From 2006 to 2010, Dan was the Senior Trade Representative at the U.S. Mission to the European Union in Brussels. Prior to that, he was an attorney in the USTR's General Counsel's Office, where he represented the United States in dispute settlement proceedings in the WTO and specialized in intellectual property rights, technical barriers to trade, sanitary and phytosanitary regulations, and trade in the environment. Mr. Mullaney is a native of Cincinnati, Ohio, my favorite state, <laughs> and has a BA from Amherst College. To Dan's left is Hido Huben. He's the diplomat who heads the trade section of the European Union delegation to, the, to Washington, D.C. He's participated in the multilateral trade negotiations of the Uruguay Round, China and, and Russia's negotiations to enter the WTO, and also the, the Doha Development Round. He joined uh, European Commissioner Peter Mandelson's cabinet, cabinet excuse me, in 2004, and later that of Baroness Ashton in 2008. From there, he witnessed the adoption of the Treaty of Lisbon, and during this period, he was also involved in the EU's legislative work to repair financial markets and to address the energy challenge. Hitto graduated from the Dutch University at Leiden in law and economics, and he was also a 2003 Yale World Fellow. So I'd like to welcome these two gentlemen today and have a good conversation. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you very much, yes, Meredith. And thank you for the uh, thank you for the invitation. Thank you for the opportunity of uh, of uh, speaking to you today in a, in a very sort of a, a in, informal setting, I guess. If yeah. you call being on a dais in front of a camera informal. Um, as uh, as Meredith said, the, the president announced a, a trade and investment partnership initiative for the Middle East and Northern Africa uh, on May 19th. Um, essentially made up of, of, of four components uh, for purposes of this, of this conversation. Um, one is to increase trade and investment integration between the United States and the region. Uh, second is to uh, increase trade integration with and investment integration within the region. Um, third was to open the door for those countries willing to take on the necessary uh, reforms to form a regional trade arrangement. And uh, fourth, and maybe, uh, maybe most significantly for purposes of this conversation, uh, he said that we should work with our uh, uh, trading partners in, in Europe to, uh, to achieve this result. So um, what have we been doing under this initiative? Um, our first job has been to, to listen. 
Uh, we've engaged in uh, extensive consultations with the private sector, with, uh, with think tanks, with others knowledgeable, uh, with the object of initially identifying what are the barriers to increased trade and investment <coughs> in the region. And then with a list of those barriers and, and prioritizing them in terms of the barriers that are the most significant, um, determine which tools we can undertake to try to, uh, try to attack those barriers. So in that context, uh, we, we engaged in um, uh, consultations with the private sector. We did a, um, a, a formal federal register notice request in September asking for comments on what we call the, the building block approach. Um, it's an approach where we identify areas where we can uh, do the most good the most quickly um, and solicited views as to how to um, um, uh, pursue those. And then, and then the, uh, the, the next step, having identified the biggest barriers to trade and investment, is to engage one-on-one -on -one with the countries in the region and as the President noted, starting with uh, uh, Tunisia and Egypt, where the, um, where the stakes are highest and the need is most immediate. Libya, of course, um, uh, quickly following um, uh, on the heels of those, those two countries. But to engage on a one-on-one -on -one basis with the countries to determine what's best for them. Because one of the comments, um, uh, or a theme to the comments that came through, was that we should be talking to those in the region as, uh, as, as as partners, as, as, as leaders, um, and determining with them what are the most important things to do. Um, there are a few areas that came up, that have come up in our, both in our consultations with the private sector and in our discussions with those in the region. Um, things like um, uh, improving the, uh, the investment climate in various respects. There's clearly a need for more investment uh, and there are certain things that these countries can do, uh, as I say, different countries can do different things uh, to encourage investment. Things from giving investor protections to uh, a legal system to uh, reductions of, uh, of uh, licensing fees and uh, bureaucratic hurdles that companies have to overcome in order to invest. Um, second area that came up uh, constantly uh, was uh, support for small and medium-sized enterprises. There's a, a broad recognition in, um, in some of these countries that, um, as in the United States and, and perhaps in Europe, that small and medium-sized enterprises can be a very significant engine for growth. But particularly in some of these countries in transition, uh, there are barriers that stand in the way of small and medium-sized enterprises in terms of being able to get information on, on, on markets, in terms of being able to get financing, in terms of um, no, of having the support that it takes, the infrastructure that it takes to, uh, to engage in trade. Um, other areas included um, uh, general issues of uh, good regulatory practices, um, things like uh, transparency, uh, publishing rules for comment, uh, public participation, uh, things that go to I think the, the, the broader thread for transition in the region, which is uh, transparency, openness, um, the underlying current is one of working against, uh, against, uh, against corruption, uh, opening up the system, making it, a more, uh, making it more available. So um, our overall theme has been to identify those things that can do the most good uh, and then to work individually with the, with the countries to achieve those. And uh, we have, um, we uh, relaunched our uh, TIFA, our Trade and Investment Framework work Agreement with Tunisia at the end of September, formed some work groups to identify in the areas identified by our consultations, um, investment, services, um, trade facilitation. Um, I forgot to mention trade facilitation, actually. the, uh, the uh, uh, the general work on the um, on making it easier to have goods pass through pass through customs, get them early released early from customs, ensure that there are um, advanced notices of of, of classification um, and basic sort of supply chain issues that that facilitate the tr the uh, the uh, uh, transfer of goods across borders. Um, so 
we've engaged, we uh, uh, relaunched our TIFA with, uh, with Tunisia and identified work groups that would work in these various areas to identify specific things we can do. Um, we've uh, established similar work groups with uh, our Egyptian <coughs> counterparts to do, to, do the, uh, to do the same thing. Um, let me shift to the fourth uh, thing mentioned by the President, which is working with our, our trading partners and, in the European Union. Um, it's a very interesting subject, in part because we, we have a very good history of working with the European Union on trade and investment issues. Um, we worked with, uh, with Europe quite closely in the context of Russia's WTO accession. Um, over the years, we've developed a, a close uh, cooperation and collaboration with other um, developing country markets where we, uh, where we share um, um, certain market, ac market access issues. Um, but the, the, the interesting thing about working with the European Union is that, of course, we have um, much in common when it comes to trade and investment throughout the world. We share a lot of values. Our two economies are probably two of the most uh, uh, integrated economies in the world in terms of, of trade and investment. But one has to acknowledge, frankly, that in third countries, we're also competitors. Um, and one also has to acknowledge that, especially when it comes to the, uh, uh, the, the MENA region, Middle East and, and Northern Africa, or as uh, the European side calls it, the uh, Southern Mediterranean or the, or the neighborhood, um, that there's a different history, um, there's a different geography, um, there's a different uh, linguistic configuration with many of the countries in Northern Africa being more familiar with, with uh, French and French markets. And, and French way of doing things than, um, than, than American. And in terms of trade policy, um, you know, the United States and the European Union are in slightly different, different places. I mean, the European Union has FTAs of a sort, even if they're sort of first generation FTAs with virtually everybody in the region, I think except maybe Syria and Iraq. Um, we have uh, FTAs, deep and comprehensive FTAs with, uh, with five countries in the region. And then trade and investment framework agreements, which are basically trade and investment cooperation with, um, with uh, uh, virtually everybody else. So we come at the region with, through, through a, a, different, a different lens. And it's probably fair to say that the first, first reaction of people who are um, uh, students of work in this area is, well, you know, the European Union's goal is um, to have the countries in the region adopt the EU acquis the set of regulations and, and, and standards that, uh, that are applied in Europe. And anybody who's watched US-EU relations recognizes that in the area of regulations and uh, standards, um, mentioned in particular things like uh, food, food safety standards, um, there are differences between uh, the US approach and the EU approach. So at first glance, um, one has to recognize that there are potentially some challenges in cooperation with the EU uh, because we are not only share things, but we are, we are competitors. Um, but I think the key, and this really, I, I think, goes to the theme of, of this conversation, uh, the key is to cooperation is that recognizing that the US and the EU are both um, collaborators, share certain values, um, but are also competitors, the, the key is to identify those things, uh, those areas that can produce significant trade and investment increases and growth and, and integration, the exercise that the United States is undertaking under this uh, trade and investment partnership initiative, um, and find the intersect between those areas and the areas that uh, the US and the EU don't really compete on. Um, the areas in which we, we share values and in particular, focus on those issues where um, the values can translate into uh, significant uh, uh, increases in trade, trade and investment. Um, happily, uh, a, a number of the issues that we've identified as being key to uh, um, uh, increase in investment and trade um, are, are also things that, broadly speaking, the US and EU share values on. Um, and I can mention, I'll, I'll mention some uh, sort of uh, 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 as, uh, as examples. Um, 
because I don't want to define the universe of things that we, we cooperate on, but rather define in a way the, 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 the parameters for our cooperation. Those things on which we, we share values and share approaches and that can increase trade and investment. Um, I can identify or, or, or suggest a few. Uh, one is the um, um, open uh, and uh, uh, investment friendly climate in countries. Uh, basic issues of uh, transparency, uh, predictability, rule of law, uh, recourse for investors. Um, you know, these are things that um, can benefit U.S. investors in the region. They can benefit local investors in the region. They can also uh, benefit uh, EU, EU companies. So it's not, um, when it comes to, say, core investment values, it's not something that the, uh, that the U.S. and the EU have uh, significant, uh, significant disagreements over. Um, another area is um, in, in trade facilitation and uh, improving, improving things like su supply chain, the ease with which good can, goods can cross borders. Um, again, if, if goods can cross borders easily, uh, they can cross borders just as easily within the region, so you can increase regional integration through this approach. They can make it easier to trade with Europe, they can make it easier to trade with the United States. It's, a, uh, it's uh, an area, I would submit, um, that uh, is, is potentially not, um, uh, doesn't lean one way uh, or the other in terms of our collaboration. Um, small and medium-sized enterprise support. Again, this is the kind of thing that um, um, if we can encourage small and medium-sized enterprises in the region to trade and invest, um, it's not something that, is, that ends up being pro-EU or pro-US, it just ends up being pro-Union and it pro-region. Um, um, uh, pro um, and it can help everybody, everybody in the region. Um, uh, other areas similarly, um, uh, the, the broad range of, of good regulatory practices, as I say, public participation in the process, um, basic notions of, of, of transparency. Um, it may be, and I don't mean to conclude this, but to make, make the, draw this conclusion, um, but it may be that one might find that when it comes to the substance of particular regulations or particular standards, um, the U.S. and the EU might have a different view on what those, what those regulations or standards could be. But where we don't have uh, a, a great deal of difference is on basic fundamental issues of transparency, public participation. And it seems to me that those, those are the kinds of things if you can identify the things that we um, um, can improve trade and investment and reflect values that the U.S. and Europeans uh, share, um, it seems like that can define a, a, a profitable set of areas for, um, for collaboration. Um, you know, you, one needs to ask, I, I think, probably the, 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 the fundamental question of, well, why, why collaborate? Why cooperate at all? Um, and I think, you know, the answer uh, is suggested in part by one of the things that Meredith said, you know, in a, in a world of, of dwindling uh, resources, um, we and um, um, perhaps the European Union have to manage our resources carefully to the, so that to the extent that we can, we can leverage our, our each other's resources to achieve these common goals, to achieve these char shared values, it'll end up being less, less costly, less resource intensive for, uh, for, for both of us. Um, the second reason is that it's much easier, and I think our, the history of our collaboration in the, in the past has borne this out, it's much easier if uh, third countries hear the same message from uh, the United States and from Europe and perhaps from other, from other trading partners uh, in the region as um, um, views on what can encourage trade and investment, because at that point, uh, it ends up being uh, a message about the policies that can actually tr increase trade and investment, and not so much the policies you know, of the United States or the policies of, of Europe. So we take a united front, and it's a lot, um, it, the, 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 the message is a lot, uh, is a lot easier to, uh, to, to deliver. Um, so 
I'm going to uh, uh, conclude there in part to leave uh, enough time for, uh, for conversation. Um, but I think when it comes to US and EU cooperation in the Middle East, um, I don't think we want to be naive and say that we're going to cooperate, we can cooperate on, on everything across the board and we'll walk down the road hand in hand singing Kumbaya because there are some, there are some, some, some different, different policy choices, different policy uh, provisions. But there is quite a lot that we can collaborate on and it makes a lot of sense for us to identify those particular things and to, uh, and to work on, uh, on working together for our joint, uh, joint goals in the region. Thank you. Great, thank you, Dean. Ditto, what's your perspective today? Well, thank you very much, um, Meredith and uh, uh, Dan. Um, and thank you for uh, organizing this, uh, this conversation <coughs> on one of the great challenges of our time. I think as Europeans, we see 1989 and 1991 as sort of seminal moments. But uh, in equal measure, I think <coughs> the events of this year uh, will fall in the same category. And so uh, it really is incumbent on all of the partner countries in this region to use whatever means we have to help them along uh, in uh, what is inevitably going to be a very difficult <coughs> period of transition. I think if I could maybe s start by saying, and I endorse, I think, what Dan said, that our starting points are very different between the EU and the US in this region because Europeans originate from the Mediterranean. This was our sea uh, that we shared with countries in North Africa. Uh, the British historian, has, um, Lord Norwich, has written a fantastic book called The Middle Sea uh, of a period in which the Mediterranean was, for all intents and purposes, for us at least, our this was our place, our place in which we lived, in which we <laughs> traded, whether it was between Rome and Carthage or the Phoenicians and the Greeks. <coughs> and so we have a very long history with the region, and uh, which is shaped by geography. And I think that, for example, if we now look at the region, we divide the region very much between the Mediterranean and the GCC. And for uh, Americans who look at the region, you have the greater Middle East. And I think you don't distinguish between the two. But we distinguish between our neighbors, and we dis distinguish between the GCC. And for the GCC, we very much want to encourage them to operate as a single, <coughs> as a single entity, uh, as suggested by, by what the GCC is meant to encapsulate. Uh, and a second point, I think, is that because these countries are our neighbors, we have very complex and very multifaceted relations with them. It's not just about trade, it's also about security, it's about organized crime, it's about migration, it's about all the different links that neighbors uh, uh, have with each other. And so in many ways it's something that you could compare, for example, with the U.S. relation with Mexico. And you try to use all the different instruments that you have in order to develop the most uh, positive uh, uh, relation uh, possible. Having said that, I do think that uh, we increasingly have similar objectives. I think we have similar constraints. And I think we have a similar anal analysis of uh, what these countries would benefit from in terms of next steps that uh, they can take. So in terms of the objectives, I think we want stable and prosperous countries there. Uh, maybe. Uh, uh, a platitude to say that, but I think that that is the sort of North Star uh, on which policies should be developed. We want to help them nurture strong institutions of state uh, in all senses, whether it's a parliament, whether it's a judiciary, whether it's the rule of law that allows the freedom of expression. Um, and we are both, I think, aware of the challenge in these countries of managing a political and an economic transition at the same time. And doing both at the same time is something uh, that is, uh, is extremely uh, challenging. Uh, I think we both are aware that there are constraints. Uh, we're in a difficult period in the world economy today. Uh, resources are not unlimited. 
Uh, but I would argue that the packages, the financial assistance packages that have been provided so far through the Doville partnership are exceedingly generous. Uh, and I'm told that they test the sort of absorption capacity of the countries in terms of being able to uh, offer meaningful uh, projects uh, for the uh, financial means that are available. The second constraint, I think, uh, certainly, which we see as Europeans if we compare this to uh, Central and Eastern Europe in 1989 and 91, is that those countries had a very clear prospect of EU membership that was offered to them. And that gave them a very uh, de defined political trajectory of reforms that increased their attractiveness for investment, that led to very rapid reforms in terms of economic and regulatory uh, frameworks. <coughs> and of course, for the uh, North African countries, the, the uh, they have to, in a sense, find uh, a destiny that is very much more their own, I think, than that of Central and Eastern Europe, where it was a, s a shared destiny and of uh, bringing them into the European uh, group of nations. And I think that's a very important uh, distinction uh, to make. Now, in terms of the uh, analysis, uh, and then I'll come a little bit to the solution, I think we... Uh, both have a shared analysis in America and in Europe about the importance of strengthening the institutions of government, <coughs> about the importance of making the region more attractive as an investment location. And obviously, the more the region is integrated, the more attractive they become as an investment hub. Uh, if you're making detergent uh, for the region uh, and you can't make uh, have a single factory that will supply the detergent to all the different markets, then you may come to the conclusion you might as well produce the detergent in Spain and export it to each of them from your production facility in Spain. On the other hand, if they have an integrated market, you may want to have one single facility in North Africa and serve the whole market from there. So regional integration, I think, again, in terms of the analysis, we believe is very much essential to create uh, the employment, the transfer of know-how that is important to uh, uh, trigger growth. And investment really is key to, uh, to that. <coughs> there is a weak SME structure. Uh, I think that's also part of our analysis, whether this is in Egypt or in other <coughs> countries. We have to do what we can to facilitate uh, the emergence of small business uh, in, uh, in the region. And we have to make uh, funds available for infrastructure, whether it is telecoms, whether it's highways, whether it's ports. All those are the essential building blocks uh, of a more prosperous, uh, of a more prosperous uh, growth. Uh, if I can just end by just making one comment uh, on regional integration, our figures suggest that only 7% of trade in the region is among the partners which is, I don't think you'll find a single region in the world that has such low intra-regional trade figures. Uh, even in Latin America, with all the geographic difficulties of trading uh, in that continent, or and certainly in, in the Asian region, you see intra-regional uh, percentages, which are in the order of 30%. So this very low regional integration component is a clear drag on the growth of the region, and you can have all the highways, and you can have uh, uh, everything in place. But if there isn't uh, easy customs uh, procedures, if there isn't a, a framework whereby countries have the confidence that if they produce uh, something, that they can sell it in each other's markets, that is uh, a, an essential uh, transformation that I think we both wish to encourage. In our negotiations with these countries, and we have individual FTAs with them in place, we have noticed that they often felt that they scored a victory if they got their tomatoes into the European market two weeks before their neighbor. Uh, it's a very simple example, but again, it shows the mindset in which in previous they were thinking that they were producing exactly the same things, whether it was textiles, footwear, uh, agricultural produce, and really going forward, you want them to move away from this 
competition with each other to get to our market and more to an overarching concept of what is good <coughs> policy to favor growth, incoming investment, uh, and the like. Now, in terms of our interaction with the region in Europe, we have a mix of bilateral and regional uh, instruments. So we meet the region together uh, at ministerial level, whether it is heads of state or trade ministers or whatever, at least once a year and sometimes more often. But at the same time, we have uh, bilateral agreements with each of the countries, except for uh, Libya and Syria. But apart from that, for all the Mediterranean countries, we have free trade agreements in place, which cover all of industrial goods and most of agriculture, about 80% of agriculture. But that means there's still 20% left, and those 20% are obviously the areas where these countries uh, have potentially significant export interests towards the European market, and this is one of those areas where we can do better. The second point, I think Dan rightly mentioned that we, these are first-generation agreements, so they don't include the services sector, they don't include investment, they don't include uh, chapters on uh, competition policy, on sustainable development, uh, and uh, those kind of supporting areas which we believe uh, will benefit the countries develop. And they also don't include, at this point in time yet, this strong regulatory component about identifying areas where if they adopt regulations which are similar to those of the European single market, then if they produce for their own market, they can immediately produce for ours as well because they will have met the requirements of, our, uh, of the European Union. And bearing in mind that 40% of their exports go to European markets, so we are by far their largest uh, export partner, uh, I would argue, uh, and I uh, agree with some of the caveats that uh, Dan mentioned, but in terms of good policy, I would argue it's very good policy for these countries to identify where they can simply uh, dock into the uh, single market rules uh, and uh, where, uh, and because that will help them export to Europe. Conversely, that will also, I think, help other countries because if you want to export to uh, Libya in 10 years' time, and Libya has in a certain sector European standards, well, you're likely to be exporting at your to European destinations in the same time, so you don't have to then comply with Libyan standards, which might be different. So in a sense, uh, I don't always share this idea that if countries adopt European uh, regulations, that that would not be in the interest of American or other uh, competing producers. I would strongly argue that actually is in their interest because they're all exporting to <coughs> Europe as well and it will just enable them to do the same uh, to do the same with those uh, those uh, markets. Uh, now what is true is that in our relations with uh, the North African countries we do still ex they do still exist through a hub-and-spoke system so we have bilateral agreements with them and we don't have a regional agreement. And I think that this is one of the great, uh, I would almost say, visionary aspects of President Obama's speech in, uh, in April, is that he did sort of put as a pole star this concept that if the region is able to work together and to create a single entity for the purposes of trade policy, uh, that that will really benefit their growth. Uh, um, of course, we would say that as Europeans, because that's who we are, uh, but I think uh, there are enough uh, demonstrations elsewhere <laughs> in the world that if you have a small domestic economy, uh, like Libya, for example, or Tunisia, uh, then you have a, a significant interest in uh, doing certain things uh, together. It also leads to more stable policy, because you don't usually change it without, you know, uh, coordinating with, uh, with uh, your other partner countries. And by extension, it always leads to more transparency because you have to go through these mechanisms of consultation with other countries. So generally, it leads to more transparency and more stability, which I think is, uh, is much in our interest. Just a couple of final words. Uh, we have, in reaction to uh, the events of this year, uh, and subsequent decisions that European leaders have taken, uh, submitted as European Commission to our member states 
mandate for new negotiations with Egypt, uh, with Morocco, Tunisia, and Jordan. And I would anticipate that Libya will follow shortly next year. Uh, the idea being that we want to complete uh, the FTAs by making them go beyond the first generation of, uh, of the existing agreements. And we are prepared to take you know, difficult decisions in agriculture and elsewhere to make, uh, to make that happen. We hope to have those mandates adopted by the end of this year, uh, subsequent to which in uh, 2012, those countries will be invited to, to express their interest in the level of ambition <coughs> and in the speed at which they wish to proceed. And I think it's no secret that we expect the Moroccans to be the first out of the box very quickly, because they usually are, closely followed by the Tunisians. Uh, and so these are, I think, aspects of which we are, with which we are very familiar. Uh, I might say a last word about the GCC, because I would be remiss if I didn't mention that. That is, uh, again, a very important uh, partner for us for many reasons, uh, uh, both economic and non-economic. We very much hope uh, that uh, this, which I think is the longest ongoing free trade agreement negotiation that the EU is involved in, I believe. Um, uh, it's been going on, I think, for at least, I think, 30 years. But that at some point, we will be able to, uh, uh, to bring that to a successful uh, conclusion. And there, I think the same applies as with North Africa, that if we can enc encourage the regional component, we believe that that would be very beneficial for, uh, uh, for the countries themselves. Uh, in conclusion, I think that uh, what Dan has said in his first sentence uh, is something I very much, uh, uh, Dan is much wiser than I am because I'm Dutch, so I always sort of say things uh, uh, before it sort of comes out of my mouth before I've sort of processed it, but Dan does this much more carefully. And I think the listening component and reacting to what the countries themselves wish in terms of the speed, in terms of the level, in terms of the intensity, and this especially applies to Egypt, I think. Uh, I think American, uh, our American friends feel this very acutely, uh, which is, I think, why you're treading very carefully uh, in, uh, in this next chapter. But having said that, I think we can say that where maybe in the past for this region the glass was half empty for many of us, it's now half full, and that our ambition for the region must be to travel with them as quickly as they can and wish in order to bring it to the full promise to which they uh, have now expressed an aspiration. Great. Thank you very much. Um, just to... to put a focus on, on the, the integration theme of trying to increase integration of trade amongst the countries in the region. The 7% the figure that you mentioned, Hedo, is really astounding. Is there, concretely, what can we do beyond customs facilitation? I mean, what, what do you see the, the customs facilitation in terms of in increasing movement in and out of borders is, is uh, step number one, of course. But where do you see concretely this objective being executed? Are there other things that we can do that will increase trade integration in the region? Um, well, I actually, I, I think um, integration in the region is um, a, a particularly interesting area because um, you know, the, the, the European Union has had um, a, a long experience, as Hito was reciting, of, of try, trying to encourage this regional integration <coughs> through the, the Barcelona process and, uh, and others. And, uh, um, you know, clearly um, uh, some creative thinking is, is needed because we, we, we find ourselves, you know, many years after the attempts were made to improve regional integration, it's not a new issue, uh, still saying things like, you know, combined exports equal to Sweden, you know. Uh, uh, so uh, I think um, if, the, if the issue is that um, in, as far as goods are concerned, uh, the countries make some of the same products, so they don't really have the, the, the different comparative advantages that allow them to exchange. exchange. Uh, that's the kind of thing that would happen with economic development and growth and investment. You would naturally right. di diversify. 
I'm not sure that that is the case. I've heard, I've heard things on both sides from the people who have commented on us, whether they, the goods are complementary or not. Um, but it does suggest, and this is so, some of the people who commented to us in response to our Federal Register notice suggested that uh, this maybe suggests that you look toward some of the more um, intangible trade, uh, trade things in services, um, uh, information communications technology, um, more of the, the, the human capital ex exchanges uh, could be a, a focus that could lead to increased um, integration. Um, I think beyond the basic trade facilitation, meaning uh, how you process goods at the border, um, various supply chain issues, I think, would, would, do, would, be, would be helpful. Uh, basic transportation, uh, that transportation issues. But I also think that beyond trade facilitation, um, having a transparent uh, regime and a regime that permits public participation and a certain degree of predictability uh, across the board in, 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 in areas beyond trade facilitation could also help, um, also help integration. I mean, some of the views I've heard have been that um, it's um, the inability of the countries to meet each other's um, regulatory requirements that have been one of the, one of the barriers. Um, you know, to the extent that that is a significant barrier, I think by, by making the process more transparent and more uh, participatory, one could encourage integration that way. I, th I think the integration component is very instructive because the EU has had a long history of, th through these FTAs and through various approaches of rules of origin and cross accumulation and diagonal accumulation, um, has, 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 uh, has um, uh, made a number of different attempts at improving integration. I think we can probably learn from each other, especially in that area, as to what works and what doesn't, and where we should be focusing our efforts and where, and where we shouldn't. I think very briefly, I mean, I'd make three very sh brief points. I think the, uh, I think the political iteration is very important. And um, in that sense, uh, I think 10 years ago, uh, two administrations ago, the policy of the US vis-a-vis -vis the region was to pursue individual FTAs. Uh, this translates into the FTA with Jordan, with Morocco, with Oman and Bahrain, I believe. Mm -hmm. uh, and the idea in that period was, well, we'll pursue these, and then at some point, other things will come together, and then we'll have the, re we'll have the regional uh, benefits in a second stage. And I think what is, uh, at least what we perceive as being a step change, is that now in the narrative, the political narrative coming from the president, and coming from uh, uh, the very high levels uh, of government in the US is that you are very clearly identifying this regional integration objective upfront as being essential for the country's own growth. And I think that is something we very much share. I think the second challenge is in the mindset of the countries themselves. So they have to go beyond this mindset of getting their tomatoes into the EU market first or their t-shirts. And that implies having a different concept of what growth will mean and being optimistic that despite currently producing a lot of the same products, uh, if you allow to, uh, this regional integration to happen, that in five or 10 years time, you will actually have comparative advantage working through different uh, parts of uh, the economy in different countries. And the third point, I think practically, is that we have every interest in supporting the Agadir process. Uh, very explicitly pushing them forward on that and saying, you know, how much progress can you do there? Can you go beyond goods? Can you go into services? Can you go into some of the regulatory trade facilitation areas? Uh, and engaging, I think, as, as, as progressively as we can on that. Sounds good. Well, I hear you say we're, we're learning from each other, communicating. We have a lot of the same goals for the region. Is there any area where we could see Practical collaboration, I mean, where would you expect us to look for that between the U.S. and the EU? Or is it premature? Um, well, it's, it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's prob probably premature to say what one, uh, what, what we would do together necessarily, but we have, um, 
you know, in some of the areas where, um, where, we, sh where we share these, these values and share these goals, some of the things we've talked about today, um, I think at a very practical level, um, you know, one could, uh, one could promote those <laughs> in, the, in, in the region um, and, and the very, at a, in a very practical level. I mean, one uh, example, uh, which might be uh, illustrative, might be I in indicative of what else we could do. Uh, earlier this year, in the context of the TEC, the Transatlantic Economic Council, we, uh, we agreed to uh, principles for uh, information communication technologies. Uh, principles of regulation which we both believe, if followed, would encourage ser services to grow in that, in that sector. And they were adopted with the, um, with the specific idea that this is the kind of thing that we could uh, promote in other countries. We could show other countries that, uh, you know, we've done, you know, look, the, the U.S. and the EU model of integration is a very, is a, is a very strong one and should be a very, uh, uh, should be a very useful model for others, others in the world. I mean, what we have done together um, over the past decades has, has worked in terms of, of, of integration, in, in terms of increasing trade. And so if we can point to things like information communication technologies, if, if, this, the, the, if regulations reflect the, um, the, the principles that are laid out in this document, this will encourage investment, encourage a sale of services in that, in that sector. Um, that's something we could concretely do potentially in this, in this, in this region. And, um, and there may be, you know, there may be, there may be other areas. Um, I mean, we are, um, uh, U USTR has a, a policy of, of trying to in encourage um, M M SMEs, um, and we're t taking some of those efforts of, of abroad. I think the EU has similar policies. I mean, there are some concrete things there we can do together to, as I say, leverage our resources in the, in the area. I mean, these are these are sort of potential, potential areas. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm actually very optimistic about how uh, the cooperation is going, whether this is between the EU and the US or in the G8 context, uh, in terms of assistance uh, to make sure that programs aren't overlapping or uh, that we focus on what is essential. Um, I suspect that at the summit between the EU and US at the end of this month, there will be a conversation about you know, how can we further support the reform pro, uh, process. I think we have a shared analysis that we have to make the economy succeed, that the economic component is going to be the bellwether of uh, how these regions succeed in their transition, in their transformation. So we have to you know, make sure, I think, first that the analysis is right, that the funds are available, uh, that they are spent wisely and coherently. And so far, I think, uh, uh, it's a pretty good performance from our side. But again, I think the destiny of these countries will be defined by what they decide and choose themselves. Terrific. We have about 10 more minutes for, for questions. So if folks could... Um, identify themselves. I think we've got some mics going around. Please make it a short question. In the back there, please. Congressional Research Service. I'm just curious about the um, mechanics of this collaboration transatlantically. For instance, we have uh, Ambassador Taylor in the Transition Office at the State Department. How often do you and your office uh, communicate with them on the strategy and on the policy? And the same with DG Trade and your special representative, Leon, for the Southern Med. And then how often do you, does USTR and, and DG Trade intend to exchange information meet? Are there regular meetings proposed? Are there discussions that are going to be set up, working groups uh, between the two organizations so that the coordination is more than just a telephone call away or something like that? And then, for instance, Mr. Mulaney, you mentioned um, you guys might have set up some working groups uh, in, in Tunisia and Egypt. How often or do they at all communicate with the EU's Tunisia task force on the ground there as well to make sure that 
the information that you're collecting and the information that they're collecting is being exchanged and, and uh, coordinated. Do these one by one or group them one by one? Okay. Your choice. Take go? Um, yeah, I, um, I talk with Bill Taylor fairly, <coughs> fairly frequently um, and, uh, and with his, his deputy, Tamara Witta, Wittes, and, and, and um, the people in the State Department in that, in that transition office. So we, we have ongoing conversations about different things. And of course, you know, I'm from U.S. Trade Representative's office, so we work on the trade and investment initiatives. Um, his remit is, is, is broader and includes uh, um, eight, eight issues, but uh, we, we coordinate quite, quite a lot. Um, on the, uh, with respect to the European Union, um, I, I and, and my staff are in fairly regular contact with our DG trade colleagues in, in the region. Um, I was, uh, my, my last posting, I was, a, I was a diplomat last year. I was in, in, in Brussels uh, for, for five years and uh, worked, worked very closely with uh, the DG trade uh, colleagues um, on the U.S.-EU relations and, and in, the, in, in the region. We continue that collaboration. So we have fairly ongoing um, uh, uh, conversations with DG Trade on what is it that we're doing, they share what they're doing, and, um, um, and I, I think both, both of our, uh, um, or at least speak for the United States, I think our, our actions are, I think are much more um, uh, much more directed and, and uh, benefit greatly from those uh, from those conversations with uh, with with DG Trade. Yeah, I'd say the same. I mean, uh, whether it is between the trade people or between the assistance people, uh, it's very regular, uh, and our contacts with the region are very regular, as are Dan's. I mean, I sometimes try to get hold of Dan, and he's not in his office because he's he's over there. So, and I think. I was speaking to somebody in Brussels this morning uh, who said he'd been to Algeria five times this year. So in terms of the channels of communication in order to identify what the priorities are, what feasible benchmarks are, where the assistance should go, I think we're, we're really trying to do our best. I mean, I should say when um, uh, High Commissioner Ashton was in Tunisia with her task force with uh, Ambassador Leon, uh, I was in Tunisia at the same at the same time. Uh, met with the um, with uh, Hido's colleague who's posted down there, and again shared what we were what we were doing, and he he did he did the same. So um, we're we're making a we're making a big effort to keep the uh, the lines of communication open. Great. Check. Um, he'll come with a microphone really quick. Thanks. I'm Chuck Dietrich from the National Foreign Trade Council. Um, in, in approaching these kinds of issues in the developing world um, in other parts of the world, we often sort of talk within the framework of uh, rather than promoting small and medium-sized enterprises, we talk about the informal versus the formal sector. Um, you know, one would argue that the t this started with the informal sector, with the fruit vendor in, in Tunisia. Do you see a difference in um, sort of the programs or the way you're approaching North Africa? Or, and is there a component that looks at how to bring the informal sector more into the formal economies of these countries? And uh, maybe since Hito um, claims that he speaks before he thinks, he could answer this question. <laughs> <laughs> Well, before I, uh, I would say, well, we're trying to do this in certain countries of Europe <laughs> as we speak, as we speak in terms of tax revenues. <laughs> so um, uh, I don't know. I mean, maybe what what because of what we do is really very much at the high regulatory level in terms of trade policy um, and in terms of assistance programs. I'm not sure, actually, I'd ha I just have to beg ignorance at how targeted they are in terms of helping certain ministries uh, bring certain parts of the economy uh, in, in, into the open. Uh, so I'm, I actually don't know. Uh, I think in Europe a lot of people feel that, possibly feel that that's part of a growth process, that once you have growth going, that then it becomes easier also to, to have administrative procedures in place which are, uh, but I certainly, 
wouldn't say that there's any way in which we countenance this part of the economy more than other trading partners do. So I don't think that there's a sort of a culture in Europe which is easier towards the gray uh, in, in trade relations. I don't think that's the case in terms of government procurement contracts or the like. Um, I mean, w I mean, one of the things that, um, that I found from talking to, um, to uh, people in, in the region is that it's, it's, it's very difficult, for instance, in Egypt to set up a business. Uh, there are lots of bureaucratic hurdles to go through. Um, and so to the extent that one makes it, uh, makes it easier to do business, makes it easier to set up a business, makes it easier to, to regularize your activities, um, I think the more likely you are to have the people in the informal sector become part of the formal sector, which then ideally becomes a little, a little less formal, which then uh, you know, ideally would, would increase the tax revenue. And um, um, so I think the general, the, the kinds of things that I was talking about wanting to do in terms of both in terms of support for SMEs, but also in terms of, of um, improving the, the, uh, the, the business climate, and the investment climate, reducing fees, um, simplifying, making it easier for uh, for entrepreneurs to start legitimate businesses, I think that should that should help this, this informal sector maybe maybe dis disproportionately um, uh, more than those who are large established co com companies who who can figure out how to how to how to work the existing system. Um, so the benefits of what we're talking about may hit that sector even more than other sectors. I should mention maybe uh, that in the new mandates that we have for these four countries, that procurement f uh, is very prominent. So there is an objective of having transparent, non-discriminatory uh, uh, procurement processes with appeals possibilities, etc. So that would obviously benefit uh, the objectives you described. Mm. Good. Um, Burger from Washington Trade Daily. Uh, I just want to do a follow-up to the CRS uh, question and sort of bring it up a notch. Uh, is there any uh, conversation or, I don't know, I would say plans, but any conversation about a high-level U.S.-EU uh, meeting in involving the, the, the region uh, on some of these uh, issues, which I, I guess we'd describe as capacity building, um, or is it politically too early to embark on something like that? Um, I, I mean, from my, 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 my perspective, the, the conversations um, at, at this point between the U.S. and the EU and, and those in, in the region are at uh, you know, a relatively more, more modest level. It's, it's not, to ex not to exclude that, uh, that, that possibility. That might, be, uh, that m might well be a, a, fair, a fair direction, direction to go. Um, I mean, I've had meetings. I don't know if I'm considered high level or not. but. Uh, <laughs> I would also say I think that these uh, issues are very demand driven so I think it's less for us to, it really is for them to sort of engage and say well how, how uh, and if they wish to do so together we'd be the first to say yes yeah that's a very that, that's a very that's a very good point going back to the first theme it's really not about dictating it's more about uh, about uh, listening and, and, and helping and being responsive to the needs of the region okay. um, yeah, get one up here. My name is Michael Stanton Geddes. I'm a researcher at Johns Hopkins and also at the World Bank. I'm curious about work to help these countries develop their or rechange their, their change, change their economies. When you look at structural problems they have as far as their workforce and the industry or mostly lack of industry, what hope is there for them to actually ever develop the high value export sectors? And what work will the EU and US do to help those countries do that? And one area I'm looking Specifically, is, is clean energy and desert tax is a big discussion building across the Netherlands, uh, CSP and PV sites. Is there any look at working with those countries to develop green industry and domestic uh, production? Well, I know that 
if I may, uh, then yeah, I know that uh, uh, the World Bank, for example, has been uh, urging us to accept that certain benchmarks that we've set in European legislation for renewable energy, that that renewable energy could be, for example, sourced in Morocco and passed through uh, into the market in Spain. So there are, uh, that's just one example, but I, I know that President Zelik uh, was pressing that with some uh, European commissioners just a few months ago. So there is, uh, I think these things are being worked at from different angles. And I think you're a touch pessimistic in terms of the capacity of countries to catch up relatively quickly. I think the lesson of the last 20 years is that if countries have the right policies in place, if uh, the workforce is really wants to get ahead in life, uh, they can catch up pretty quickly. Uh, and so, again, I think there's every reason for optimism, but we have to make sure that you know, we bear the promise out. I think that's, the, that's really the challenge. Mm. Okay. And I think part of what we're doing is trying to create an environment in which you know, the, the, the private sector can determine uh, you know, what are the areas where there's a comparative advantage, where can they create the high value, the high value export. So it's not less about us deciding which, which sectors are the ones that the, that the companies need, countries need to invest in and more creating an environment where the, where the private sector, where the businesses can actually sort that out for themselves. I guess we probably have one or two. We'll do one here and then maybe one over there. Up here in the front. Yeah. Joxy with uh, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Uh, question for Mr. Huben. You mentioned that there was an effort potentially to upgrade the Euromed agreements with Egypt and Morocco. Could you expand on that? Uh, well, so with Egypt, Morocco, Jordan, and Tunisia, the Commission has submitted uh, negotiating directives to our member states, uh, which are currently being considered by them because they are the our authorizing environment, uh, uh, as it were. Um, and we hope that that process will be concluded by Christmas. And that will mean that as of Christmas, we can engage those four countries to upgrade our current FTAs, which are goods only, as Dan said, they're first generation FTAs, and we want to upgrade them, and then we can I try to incorporate all these new aspects which are important, uh, either to increase investment or to include services trade, or the sort of regulatory issues like procurement that Chuck was referring to uh, earlier. And so the idea is really, and that's why we call them deep and comprehensive free trade agreements, uh, and these are within the context of our Euromed policy, but they are individual agreements with individual countries. Okay. Let's see, one more question. Um, maybe over here. Uh, my name is Ben Hancock from Inside US Trade. Um, there seems to be some amount of skepticism about uh, the possibility for regional integration. Um, and obviously, history shows that it's been a challenge. And I wonder if you could tell us why there's reason to be more hopeful. And also, uh, one of the ideas that I had heard put forward by some um, kind of think tank type people is how to maybe harmonize rule, uh, preference programs with the EU and US and whether that would spur some kind of uh, regional integration effort um, and I wondered if that's something you all are considering <laughs> at all. Thank you. Um, I mean, I wouldn't, uh, I don't think I would characterize um, the approach to integration as, as skepticism as, as much as um, there's obviously uh, a, a, a problem there, a lack of, 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 of integration. I think we have to get down at a very granular level and, and figure out why it is that the companies aren't, the countries are not trading with each other as, as much as their level of development would, su would suggest. Um, I mean, there are certain things that have been done in the past to encourage integration. Um, it hasn't um, yet r resulted in, um, in a desirable level of integration. So, so clearly, you have to look at, look at other things. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't call it so much as skepticism as is you know, recognition that there is there's a, 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 a challenge to be met there, and, and the way to meet it, I think, is at a, at a very 
granular level to try to identify why it is that the countries aren't trading with each other, investing with each other, investing each other, and um, and then um, addressing those issues uh, <laughs> uh, head on. Um, on on uh, harmonization of, of preference programs, I think we we you know. I mean, one of the things that we want to um, uh, will likely be looking into is um, is maybe um, uh, assistance with countries taking advantage of our generalized system of preferences for the countries and the products to which that that applies. Um, it's not. Um, I think our, our focus will probably be on that. It's not clear. It's not cl clear to me the level to which uh, you know, harmonization of, of that would necessarily be be be, be helpful. But anyway, I, I think. Just to make sure I'm clear. Harmonization from the EU and US programs. That's what I was referring to. Right. Right. Well, what I can mention, uh, I think, at two levels. I think at the sort of at the political level. A lot of obstacles to regional integration had existed, whether it was personal because President so-and-so didn't like Colonel so-and-so or vice versa. Those conditions uh, don't exist anymore, and you could argue that in the new constellation, uh, these countries will see each other as natural um, parts of the family, uh, which is, you know, after all, the aspiration of the Arab League. At the technical level, uh, one of the areas where, again, I think we do genuinely have a head start over other trading partners is that we have bilateral FTAs with these countries, but in the context of our relations with the, with the, within the Mediterranean, we have, for example, rules of origin that permit these countries to accumulate with each other. So we have what we call pan-European uh, uh, rules of origin, so that a product, if a product starts in Tunisia and then is processed, uh, in Egypt, uh, then it can benefit from the, from the preference simply by accumulating. And to the extent that all these countries have free access to our market, so there's no uh, tariff or other restrictions except for a very small number of agricultural products, uh, the combination of the absence of trade barriers with this accumulation of origin in terms of rules of origin, I think, actually means that you know, it's in place. It's in place for them. So the challenge for them is really to now get them to actually develop a manufacturing capacity uh, which will create employment and, and the like. Because the, the access to our market is, if, by virtue of trade barriers, it is, n is not really the problem anymore, at least not in the manufacturing sector. I think, as I said, the, some of the, the fundamental issues um, of re regular, I mean, how, which, which regulations a, 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 a country develops and, um, and, and how they develop them are in a way two different, two different issues. And I think, you know, when it comes to issues of, say, transparency, uh, public participation, that, <coughs> that, um, Set of issues you would call good regulatory practices. The, you know, those are the kinds. Those are the kinds of things that uh, uh, that you know, clearly would be useful in the region, without speaking to the, subs the substance of what's actually in in the regulation. But I think there's 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 um, profitable collaboration that can be had on the um, on the, uh, uh, the, the the broad area of transparency and public participation and good regulatory practices. Good. Um, I think we're going to conclude. We're running out of time here, but I want to ask the audience to join me in thanking Dan and Hiddo for great presentations. <laughs>